In 1863, Jules Verne had a vision. He called it Paris in the 20th century. He foresaw a future of electric lights, automobiles, and roads streaked with traffic. It was the story of a world gone wrong. He even predicted that a vast mechanical cathedral would rise in the center of Paris. But the book was too pessimistic to print. In 1889, technology caught up. But Verne had moved on. His next book, From the Earth to the Moon, was an optimistic celebration of the triumph of science. Today, 40 miles outside Paris, Verne's 19th century fantasy of space travel is slowly becoming real. This is a story where fact and fiction change place. It's a story about the future and the people who invent it. Eight miles north of Los Angeles, a few minutes' drive off the interstate, is the small suburb of Glendale. Hidden in the quiet, tree-lined streets is a high-security compound. Exactly what happens inside has remained a closely guarded secret for over 40 years. What goes on here is a kind of madness. This is the place where the Walt Disney Company conjures up new forms of mass entertainment. A Disney Imagineering reality is kept at arm's length. Here, even the drinking fountains have ideas of their own. Hey, what you trying to do, drown me? It's a combination of imagination and engineering. People with pocket protectors and pens and their engineers and their electronics experts and scientists and dreamers and artists and sculptors. Uh, you couldn't imagine a more diverse collection of people all combined to the same goal. Yahoo! This is gonna be the, that's the part that I'm waiting for. <laughs> Officially its purpose is to be the master design, planning, and construction entity for the theme parks. What it is in Reality is a bunch of wackos all locked into a large set of buildings, the function of which is to invent the future of theme parks. That future is the world's most technically advanced ride. Called Space Mountain, it's being planned in Los Angeles and will be built in Disneyland Paris. This is a make or break year for team leader Tim Delaney. An idea he first sketched out in 1988 will open as a 90 million dollar attraction in four months time. We design these attractions for ourselves. We design and say, what do we think would be really great? I mean, that's what Imagineering is all about. We kind of go out there and say, what do we think would be the newest and latest and most challenging experience? The process starts with this modified flight simulator as Bran Ferren's team begin to transform Delaney's dreams into hard engineering data. It gives us a way to feel and experience what the ultimate attraction will be like. Before you have to bend steel, pour concrete, and do things that are a little hard to change. With this, we can simulate much of the ride experience and simply by a few strokes of the keyboard, change it till our creative people are satisfied that this is the kind of experience they really want to provide our guests. The data is collected and converted into a rudimentary three-dimensional model. The Space Mountain ride takes its first computer-aided steps. Passengers will board one of five trains, as in Jules Verne's story from the Earth to the Moon. They will be packed like ammunition into the breech of a five-meter wide cannon. A huge explosion fires the train up and into the blackness of space. The passengers will not see this track or the surrounding structure, 
as they hurtle at speed, disorientated, upside down and in the dark. Towards the end of the two minute ride, they seem to fly through a cluster of asteroids, crashing through one in a shower of sparks. On a wet night just under three months before Space Mountain is due to open, carriages for the rocket train are shipped in from Holland. The hardware for Space Mountain has been arriving in a steady stream from factories all over Europe. Most of it is going together well. The mountain, a vast steel volcano, is now a familiar silhouette to visitors. But it's far from complete. The software that will drive the ride is so complex that a technical team has been recruited from the aerospace industry. There is a lot of interaction between the technical people and the creative people. The previous uh, work environment I had been in, which was working uh, with NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which was much more scientifically oriented. There was very little emotion in the, in the product you were trying to deliver. And there's certainly nothing like when you finally do open one of these attractions to the public and seeing people's first reactions. You certainly aren't asking them, well, did you, could you tell how many G's you were feeling at that point in the ride? It's, are they excited? Are they yelling and screaming and laughing and having a good time? And that's the payoff. We present the first of our science factual programs, Man in Space. Forty years ago, space pioneers needed Disney to promote their vision. In our modern world, everywhere we look, we see the influence science has upon our daily lives. Discoveries that were miracles a few short years ago are accepted as commonplace today. Many of the things that seem impossible now will become realities tomorrow. One of a man's oldest dreams has been the desire for space travel. To travel to In many ways, the Man in Space team of 1955 were Disney's prototypes for the Imagineers. To, the threshold of a new frontier. The frontier of to give the television audience a glimpse of the experience of space travel, they went to extraordinary lengths to create a completely convincing and factually accurate film journey from the Earth to the Moon. Here's director Ward Kimball to tell you about it. In working with engineers and scientists, we have found that there are many different opinions as to how we will eventually cross the space frontier. Ward Kimball still lives in Los Angeles. His home is a real monument to a lifetime in the movie business. Walt Disney knew of Kimball's fascination for UFOs and the paranormal and warned him to control his instincts for invention. That's the way to go. Making the, the pictures science factual, not science fiction. To ensure the film's scientific accuracy, Kimball went looking for a technical expert. He found him in German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. Von Braun had designed the V-2 rocket and after the Second World War was brought over by the American government to work on their missile program. But Von Braun had his own plans. He knew he had a big thing there with television. That's, that was the thing that sold him on doing this. Now here's a model, my design for a four-stage orbital rocket ship. Compared to the unmanned instrument rocket, it is quite large but the overall size and weight of the rocket is mainly... Man in Space was a technical tour de force. The scientific detail of the film was extraordinarily accurate. Von Braun even suggested the astronauts would return in a prototype version of what was to become the Challenger Space Shuttle. The payload in the top section will consist of ten... In effect, the film was a direct sales pitch to the American public for his belief in the reality of space travel. If we were to start today on an organized and well-supported space program, I believe a practical passenger rocket could be built and tested within 10 years. I was very young at the time, and I remember watching the show. 
in like one of the commercial breaks or the end of the show, and I had asked my parents, you know, was that really real? And I think they said something like, well, no, I think Mr. Disney just made all that up. Our spaceship moves ponderously toward the firing site. After von Braun's introduction to Man in Space, his scientific theories were brought to life in an animated rocket flight. I was also very positively affected by the fact that someone could take a dream or something that had not existed before and put it into a form that seems so absolutely real. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. At 7.30 on March the 9th, 1955, an eight-year-old Tim Delaney and a hundred million others switched on their televisions to watch Man in Space. Equally enthralled was a 65-year-old viewer in the White House. It impressed President Eisenhower. I can remember this, and the next day he phoned Walt, wanted to borrow a print of it. Walt wanted to know why. He says, I'm going to show it to all of those stuffed shirt generals that don't believe we're going to be up there. Man in Space created a sensation. In the Pentagon, it was run and rerun in private screenings. While on June the 15th, due to massive public demand, it was also re-aired on television. On July the 29th, now assured that both the military and the people would back the huge expenditure, the American space program was launched. Kimball's factual film inspired Tim Delaney's fascination with the science fiction behind Space Mountain. The attraction is based on Jules Verne's 19th century novel, From the Earth to the Moon, where a team of French and American explorers collaborate to build a cannon and fire themselves to the moon. But for the visual style of Space Mountain, Delaney hasn't relied solely on contemporary illustrations. The look of movies like Segundo de Chaumont's 1909 Excursion sur la Lune has provided a huge repertoire of early science visions. The extraordinary sets of the 1954 Disney version of another classic Verne novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, has been the inspiration for the rivet and boilerplate aesthetic of Space Mountain. These influences are combined to create a pre-space age vision of future technology. At the heart of the mountain is Jules Verne's Columbiad, a massive 15-ton cannon. This cannon clearly represents the fact that you, this is an experience that when you get in it and you're launched, I mean, a cannon, big bang, launch, high speed, it will pay off. But beneath the carefully art-directed exterior of Space Mountain is a private, unseen world of steam, oil, and electronics. Ron Hamming is part of the technical team who must make the cannon work. Tower from Project 34 going through door 12. There are six weeks to go. The pusher vehicle consists of a chassis that's mounted on rails, mounted below the, the main ride rails, uh, and has a fin that, that interfaces with the launch pole on the train. From this point, it launches the train up to the top of the catapult. A mechanical engineer from Garrett Air Research, Hamming has devised a catapult launch system based on aircraft carrier technology. We've come up with a concept similar to a very high-speed winch system which acts as a catapult but more more reliably and more safely than something that the military would use for their pilots and their planes. This is the underside of the catapult. Train comes up here, the pusher vehicle attaches 
to the train and launch the train into the mountain. The whole catapult launch duration is over within about three seconds. In this three seconds, they've transited about, uh, about 50 meters of track. So it's uh, comparable to going to about zero to 50 miles an hour in, in about two seconds. The g-force of 1.5 felt by the passengers is just the start. The physical thrust will be given additional psychological impact with movie-style special effects. A huge explosion, smoke, and stereo sound are being installed by special effects expert Jack Gillette. I started over the studio, uh, I was over there for about five years before I moved over to WDI. So a lot of the same technology that, that you see in there works back and forth. A lot of the special effects you see in the movies are for a one-time shot though. And we have to make our effects go off 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. So that's, that's kind of a challenge in itself to make sure that you can not only do the effect once, but you can keep on doing it. The connection with the movie business is not accidental. From the start, the company tried to bring the controlled experience of cinema to the theme parks. Walt Disney wants you to step into the scene. That's why we call Disneyland on stage. And when the cast members, which we, our employees are called, go behind the scenes or you know, go out into the, behind the, uh, the attractions and so forth, that's known as backstage. So Disneyland is a stage. And you're just stepping on the stage. We just deleted the seats. In movies, music can change the mood of a scene in an instant. A synchronized score has never been possible in a ride, but Delaney is determined to use the musical power of films like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea to manipulate emotions on Space Mountain. Steve Bramson has won an Emmy for his work with Steven Spielberg. Now it's Space Mountain. Now, I wanted to have some swirling. I mean, we have, you know, some kind of swirling effect, which is very hard for me to duplicate on the piano. You have all the brass very heroically playing, you know, with the, the violins up here, kind of singing away and they're there. When it's finally orchestrated to the way that the players will see it, you can see all this detail here. The idea of this sort of thing is a, you know, taken exactly from a film. The only difference is you are there. While Bramson struggles with the music in Los Angeles, in Paris, the ride is tested for the first time with sandbags instead of passengers. The reason no one has written synchronized music for a roller coaster ride is that it's been technically almost impossible. As with most really great projects, they ought to be creatively driven, not technologically driven. So the fact that it's difficult or unpleasant to accomplish um, really ought to be secondary to that it's wonderful to experience. It was decided early on that wouldn't it be great to have sound to be able to score something like a roller coaster ride. That's never been done before. And the answer is yes, it would. We did some tests. And then the problem is, OK, how do we make this really work? How do we get you to hear high quality sound and special effects give you directional effects while you have wind blowing in your face, the sound of other roller coasters, people screaming their brains out. The Imagineer solution was to develop the local control unit, or LCU, installed in Paris by audio specialist John Groper. The LCU is basically uh, similar to a MIDI recording studio or playback studio and uh, all included right here on board. The Sound processing uh, takes place in here, and then we store the actual program material on these devices here, which are called flash memory cards. And each of these cards, which is about the size of a credit card, holds 20 megabytes of memory in solid state form. And uh, it doesn't move. 
which is very important for uh, this onboard uh, roller coaster, uh, because uh, if it moved, it would likely move at the wrong time under the vibration of the roller coaster. Each train has its exact position on the track plotted by infrared sensors. When it's recorded, Steve Brampton's score will be separated into musical layers and digitally stored on the flashcards. As passengers move through the attraction, the music will be automatically re-cued and remixed to synchronize exactly with the ride experience. By the early 60s, with the prospect of a successful moon landing growing nearer, the Imagineers were able to use space technology to create a form of primitive robotics. Take a drink from the Ohio. Called audio animatronics, the technology would play a major part in Disney's optimistic depiction of the future. Now this contraption here might look like something from outer space, but it's actually a control harness for programming the actions and gestures of our audio animatronic figures. Shall we show them how it works? Really well. This is the Carousel Theater host. Whatever the man in the harness does, this figure will respond simultaneously in the same manner. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. An audio animatronic family populated the Carousel of Progress, its theme tune echoing Disney's faith in things to come. And tomorrow's just a dream away. For 40 years, Disney had promoted his special brand of optimism. But three months after this clip of film was shot, Disney died, missing the moon landing he had yearned for by three years. The astronauts returned to find themselves transformed into media stars. Their scientific achievement was swallowed up in show business. Once men were on the moon and the dream faded, with it went some of the naive optimism of Disney's vision of the future. I guess after Walt died, it became uh, uh, difficult. I wasn't in the company, but I think uh, the creative side became more of what would have Walt thought, what would have Walt done, and the business side became more conservative and, 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 and stronger. Uh, things got done, great things got done. Epcot Center got built, uh, Tokyo Disneyland got built, but experimentation, uh, risk-taking, uh, insanity, neurotic creative behavior was replaced by a studied business practice. One of the first casualties was a song behind the carousel of progress. Instead of wait for tomorrow, the theme became live for today. You've got it made, the world's forward marching and you're in the parade. Now is the time, now is the best time, be it. And the idea of space travel changed from a scientific adventure into an entertaining storyline. For it's the best time of your life. At Space Mountain, reality has intruded on the fantasy in the shape of the French government and inspector. The, train goes and to see how it feels for you the, the first gas. test will be to see if the train can stop itself in the event of a software failure. This means programming a deliberate breakdown into the ride control system. So Brian's going to make the software patch. I saw that also on the main. The system has to fail safe and we have to go through all the failures and sometimes that's what takes a lot of time is is creating failures that are supposed to happen one in a million or are never supposed to happen trying to figure out now that you have the system in place so that these things can't happen you make them happen so you can see how the system reacts uh, Greg was that uh, break 17 that you wanted to close after the vehicle struck uh, sensor 2PA? The vehicle passes 2PA please close break 17 yes. Ten. Just the last where you're sitting only you want a heavy train. If Space Mountain fails any of the stipulated tests, it won't be able to open as an attraction. Yes. And then for the front. Oh, uh, it's the middle. Okay. Okay. Susan for Greg. Okay, we have the software patch in and we're ready to launch. You guys ready?
Ready to go? I'll ride with okay. Michelle. Somebody, uh, I go with you, Michelle. Okay, we're ready here. Okay, Tower, give me an announcement and I will start it off. Attention Space Mountain, attention Space Mountain. Rocket train will launch in the mountain immediately, please. Thank you, all equipment, please. Thank you. Attention Space Mountain, attention Space Mountain. Un train va être catapulté dans la montagne immédiatement. Il faut les faire de tout équipement. Merci. How's that? Okay, Suzanne. You are good. Okay? Same? The train Better? fails safe. It passes the test. Over the next two weeks, other tests will not go so well. The repeated testing holds up other work, and now Jack Gillette's special effects inside the mountain are running behind time. That's a little too effective. <laughs> Disney in the early 80s existed in a changed world. The 50s optimism about the future was replaced with a new sense of uncertainty. Tron, Disney's first film attempt to grasp this, was a darker vision of a computer gone mad. I had a conversation with our Imagineers, most of whom, like me, grew up in an Orwellian, Orwellian uh, kind of uh, a view of the future, a, a, uh, a Tomorrowland view of the future, a Star Trekian, Star Warsian view of the future, and all of a sudden it seemed like maybe the future was kind of going back to a, a, a less high-tech view, a less polyester view. I think the average American thought the future was the Jetsons. It was um, skateboards floating through the air. It was that things made out of plastic were intrinsically superior to things that grew. Our challenge is how, in a theatrical attraction, to create a sense of future. And the sense of future may have absolutely nothing to do with chronological prediction. What it has to do with is mood and feeling and passion about what there is to come. The response has been a march back to imagination. Delaney's obsession with Jules Verne's Victorian science fiction offered Disney a new future a low-tech fantasy with a happy ending. But behind the fantasy, there are urgent practical realities. 600 volunteers pack Space Mountain as the Ministry of Transport look on. An evacuation rehearsal is underway. Ladies and gentlemen, we are sorry for the delay. We're working on the prom and we will be back up as soon as possible. We'll let you know when we can start riding the train again. But the ride operators are caught up in the excitement of the attraction. They talk to the visitors rather than getting them out. There is a classic breakdown of communication. 7.30, the last evacuation time. Half an hour. This is a vital stage in the gradual transfer of control from the Imagineers to the local Disney operators who must run the ride on a day-to-day -day basis. Sorry? Yeah, we're missing one. Here we go. We need to work on our evacuations a little bit, though. For Doug LeBlanc, who has to formally hand over command in two weeks, the test has shown just how much there is still to do. They talked to the guests for five minutes before they started releasing harnesses. 
Well, maybe he had some good jokes to tell. I don't know. Well, and I noticed that the other break zone took even longer. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah we're not doing badly for the first night. Second. <laughs> Second. The process must be repeated until the ride safety can be signed off. But the tests have revealed an alarming piece of information. Hello? Back in Los Angeles, Tim Delaney gets an urgent call from Paris. Okay, wait a moment. Well, my confidence is really boosted here. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello again. Hello? The government officials claim that the train is running faster than is safe or legally permissible. They won't let it open unless Delaney slows it down by 15 seconds. Uh, 15 seconds? Yeah. Once we start creeping up anywhere above five or six seconds, it's, it becomes much more difficult to get the music in sync yeah. you know, via editing and stuff like that. It'll just really For be music scary. producer Aaron Richard, the immediate problem will be resynchronizing the complex music track. It seems to me that would have a significant show impact uh, on the ride. Now we've got a, a real significant problem. Now we really have an issue that we have to, uh, uh, to battle on. The orchestra recording session due later that night in Hollywood is cancelled, but at a cost. Time is running out. Cutting the speed could affect the capacity of the ride. But the greatest pressure on Delaney is creative. Slowing the ride will destroy the experience he wants to offer visitors. He can see eight years' work evaporating in a cloud of bureaucratic compromise. It's time to confront the president of Imagineering, Marty Sklar. Yes. Do you have a moment? Yes, yes sir. Talk about? Yes, Tim. Excuse me interrupt? Uh, we got a bit of a problem on the ride. The ride's running a little too fast. And the implications of this is the music is going to be out of sync. Well, this all sounds too familiar. The show always ends up the last thing we figure out how to do. If we run four trains, then it's a situation where we don't get the capacity. If we run five trains, then there's a potential of trains potentially backing up inside the mountain. So we're off like five seconds, and everyone over in France is scrambling to actually tune this thing to find out where we take up the five seconds. So it is a big issue because capacity is going to be key with the, what we know is going to be the popularity of this. The whole issue of capacity, the thrill of the ride, working with the show, working with the music are all the implications of this. Delaney's on the next flight to France. This is the first time he has seen the completed Space Mountain. Delaney was trained as a graphic designer. He's obsessed with the visual. He doesn't like what he sees. The cannon looks too clean. The mechanism feels fake. For him, the fantasy will only be truly effective if the cannon is a believable piece of machinery. For a moment, problems with the music are forgotten as Delaney gets to work with the team of scenic artists. Coming through here, and right, it's a little bit dark in the crevices there, and then on the edges, we'll highlight those edges so it looks like freshly painted. It looks like it's been used, but actually, we're taking really good care of it. All this area up here, I wouldn't touch this. I mean, I wouldn't do too much character finishing here. I wouldn't do any at all, as a matter of fact. But down up here, down up around in that area there, where the gun side is, make it look as, as rich and as well taken care of as possible. Up to the top of the world. On the roof of Space Mountain, Delaney is happier. So, Joe, hold on a second. Yeah. The lighting in the telescope. Lighting designer Joe Fonsetta has finished work on an extraordinary futuristic icon. The lighting up through all the metalwork. 
just fantastic. I mean, this is like a beacon. It's like it's like the mothership it's, on it's top a of birthday uh, cake. Yeah, it is a birthday cake. The theme was birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> At night, the full effect of his design can be appreciated. Eve, uh, to a lamb boat. Okay, are you on the roof? Yes, I'm flagging the light now. 51 for 17, is it any better? Parfait. The biggest challenge was trying to light a monster. It's a huge building, uh, and it's such an unusual shape, an unusual design. But to light it in such a way that it wasn't heavy-handed, to light it in such a way that the lighting was a living part of it, uh, an integral part of it, um, that was the challenge. Ready? You ready? Yeah. 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 Okay. Composer Steve Bramson flies in the next day with a basic synthesizer version of the score. This is his first time in Paris and his first ride. Expected, the music doesn't fit. The rollout this time, we yeah. got it was fine to the dip, but we arrived at the first parking point. Uh, the music was still going, and then the the time it took to move to the launch position was much it longer. It seemed longer, yeah, it was. And longer. that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. I thought. We'll have to talk with Greg and find out because it seemed like there's that initial kind of connection. And then it pushed up. It was it was like a I slight delay there. We can have two seconds difference between hot and cold trains. Okay. Fast and slow okay. trains. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. exactly. So that means 11 second per 11 meter per right. second. That's 22 meters. So that means one complete train difference. Three and a half seconds. Things are made worse for him when Delaney uses the rescoring process as a chance to try out some new ideas. Stop. Build that tension then a little bit. Build the tension a little bit. Build the anticipation. Bramson is beginning to realize that a complete music rewrite is needed. Delaney heads home, leaving a trail of work in his wake. Inside the mountain, Jack Gillette has to boost the effects in the asteroid scene. The scenic artists start to refinish the cannon, covering it in a film of soot and oil. With just two weeks to go, there is a growing sense of anticipation. I'm not a movie person, but we are a movie company, and when I talk to the studio people, they, they always tell me there is always this moment of nervousness. In fact, the first weekend to launch the movie. And once you have already a one day, you know, or a three days weekend, clearly you know exactly where you're going to go. And for whatever reason, advertising is a large part of it, but there is this word of mouth and there is this kind of, you know, secret thing going among people where, where they decide to come. Back in Hollywood, with 10 days to go, Bramson's rescored music is ready to record. There just really is nothing like a real large orchestra. The colors will just be that much more sharper. You know, the, the, the silvery uh, glow uh, of, the, of the flutes and the, um, you know, the power and the excitement of the brass will be much more real and uh, discernible then to the synthesizers.
the ride works. It's slightly altered speed and the new music synchronized. But in France, there are more problems. The cannon, a vital component and the explosive start to the ride, has broken down. No one knows why and no one can get it to work. Delaney designed the Columbia to recoil when it fires. The detail is a classic piece of movie storytelling, a technical special effect that brings the fantasy and drama of the story to life. In 1955, Ward Kimball was in the middle of a similar battle with Man in Space. Get some flares in that area, quick. We did have a little argument with Von Braun. When we went around the moon, we dropped some rockets from the moon ship to light up the surface. And, uh, and I said, couldn't we have sort of an indication of a foundation of an ancient city or, or a lookout or a... Uh, a, a fortress or something there, and he says, well, uh, they, the other side of the moon is, looks much like the side we look at. You can do that, but uh, I won't have my name on it. So we did. We passed this, looked like the foundations of something. It was just a little touch. or not, there's now little more that Delaney can do. As Space Mountain prepares to open for the first time, he is back in Los Angeles. With 36 hours to go, ride engineers fix the problem. Space Mountain opens on time and working perfectly. Every 36 seconds, 55 new passengers will experience every detail of the dream Delaney first had eight years ago. But as he clears his office, his mind is not on Paris or with Space Mountain, but on the beginnings of a new piece of madness. Pop stars and Bible bashers and a bit of opera. Wogan's Island on BBC One in just a moment. Next on BBC Two, a profile of Andrew Neil.